Our topic tonight is the perennial philosophy. To put the topic in some context, I'm going to make brief reference to two video clips I did previously. In this video clip, I uh, discussed this definition of the word mysticism. Mysticism refers to experience of, or even union with, in some sense, union with, ultimate reality, ultimate ground of existence, or some personal God. It's used also to refer to experiences of Jesus or Krishna or whatever. It can be found in all religious traditions, according to Wikipedia. And this is a picture of someone who is experiencing the ultimate ground of existence, which we also call the uncreated light. And I mentioned in another clip how the idea of uncreated light occurs in the Eastern Orthodox branch of Christianity. So, I first encountered the idea of the perennial philosophy in a book written by Aldous Huxley. And uh, Mr. Huxley was uh, widely uh, acknowledged as one of the foremost intellectuals of his time, according to Wikipedia. He had an interest in philosophical mysticism, and he wrote the book, The Perennial Philosophy, in 1945. Here it is, uh, published then. Here's a, the contents, give you an idea of what it talks about. Now, as it turns out, I first encountered the perennial philosophy, actually not in this book, but in an introduction to another book, an entirely different book. Now, this, this book here, is uh, talks about or is a translation of a Hindu scripture, but it has an introduction by Aldous Huxley, and in that introduction he gives a nice, concise summary of the perennial philosophy. So I'm going to reference that introduction to discuss the perennial philosophy rather than the book he wrote of the same title. So here's how the introduction begins. The author is. Uh, saying that what he calls the perennial philosophy has, he can find traces of it, let's say, in Vedanta, which is a Hindu philosophy, Hebrew prophecy, the Bible. This is a Chinese scripture, the dialogues of Plato, the gospel according to St. John. This is the branch of Buddhism. Plotinus lived around 400 AD. He was a disciple of, uh, or a follower of Plato. This man has an interesting history. He was thought for centuries to be a direct disciple of St. Paul, but eventually it was discovered that his writings were dated from about, I think, 300 AD. Persian Sufis, they're Islamic mystics. And so the perennial philosophy has, according to Mr. Huxley, been an element of all these different religious traditions. And he says that under this confusion of tongues and myths, we can find a highest common denominator. So he is saying that this is something that these religions have in common. He goes on to say that to know it in its fullness can only be achieved through contemplation, not through any verbal statement. And we'll see this point. He returns to this point again. And he's claiming basically that the people who have had mystical experience that their records of whatever religion they happen to be a part of show a commonality, that they are experiencing a similar or identical thing, having a similar or identical experience. Now, people have disputed uh, what he's saying, by the way, but I'm just presenting Mr. Huxley's view of the perennial philosophy tonight. Okay. So, at the core of the perennial philosophy, we find four fundamental documents. First, the phenomenal world of matter and individualized consciousness, that is ego, the world of animals, uh, men, and even gods, is a manifestation of the divine ground. Now, I've mentioned in other videos how personal gods, even if they exist, Jesus, Krishna, are manifestations of the ultimate ground of existence, manifestations of Godhead. The second principle is that human beings are capable not merely of knowing about what he's calling the divine ground, I would call the ultimate ground of existence or the uncreated light. They can have a direct intuition. I've mentioned in another video about how like experience of the uncreated light is an experience more like putting your hand in an electrical socket than like having a thought. 
it's an actual experience as opposed to a mental thought. He goes on to say that the second, second doctrine that we just saw, that it's possible to know the divine ground by direct intuition, higher than discursive reasoning, is to be found in all the great religions. And by the way, what we're doing is discursive reasoning in this series. But I, I try to point to direct experience and maybe watching this series will play a part in someone actually having direct experience someday. I don't know. He goes on to say that uh, Buddha and Muhammad and wh whoever have basically said the people who just are willing to philosophize and not try to experience are... Uh, a herdsman of other men's cows or whatever. Okay. Now, the third doctrine is that we possess a double nature, a phenomenal ego and an eternal self. I want to just stop for one second. I mentioned in another video how the ultimate ground of existence can be called our eternal self. But on the other hand, it's not particular to me. So if I'm if I uh, consist of body, emotion, intellect, and consciousness, and if consciousness is identical, let's say, with the ultimate ground of existence, then my consciousness is no different than yours. It's as if we both have a drop of water. So it can be called myself, but it's perhaps since self is capitalized, it might be called the self of the universe, the uh, ground of the universe. I won't get into that right now. But anyway, he goes on that we possess a double nature, and if, it's, uh, if we desire it and try to, we can identify with the spirit and the divine ground. And then he goes on to say the fourth man's life on earth has only one purpose, to uh, identify with the um, divine ground. Now that, I believe, is for people who accept this philosophy. That's the goal of the philosophy, is to have that experience. But uh, as I mentioned in another clip, our purpose on earth is what we make it. It's what we want it to be. And um, most people do not have this as their purpose. They find another purpose for their life. Okay, the third doctrine which affirms the dual nature is fundamental higher religions. We've spoken about cosmic consciousness and other things uh, in, in this series. And the idea here is self-denial and charity. And uh, I won't get into it too much, but the idea is that if we identify with our phenomenal ego, that's at uh, this level, where we are now. But if we want to have experience of our deeper self, we have to kind of, in some sense, let go of our identification with our ego. That could be a whole other uh, video. Okay. And these four doctrines constitute the perennial philosophy in its minimal form. Uh, some people, that's enough. Uh, he goes on to say that for a lot of people, they need something more. They need some sort of human incarnation of the divine ground. And I remember when I read this many years ago, I thought, well, that's where the trouble starts. The idea being that up till now, we had a a highest common denominator, a, 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 a denominator that even a, a religion that even could be trans species. The idea is we could imagine that other intelligent species could experience ultimate ground of existence, not necessarily humans. But once you get into a incarnation, that separates us into different religions, right? I mean, um, the follower of Jesus is not the follower of Krishna, and vice versa. But he, he affirms that that's a, a common element of uh, religion. And that's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, this has been short. I just wanted to introduce this concept. I think that uh, I would like to think that this series is presenting one form of the perennial philosophy also. But thank you.